Brexit is uh, an unmitigated disaster. Um, I think uh, that for young people, it, it's uh, very sad that they don't have the opportunities I had 35 years ago to come to Europe, get a job, work, fall in love, buy a house, all these things. Andrew, thank you very much for agreeing to take part in our Brexit Reality Portrait series. Please could you start by introducing yourself to our viewers. Good morning, Leila. It's great to see you. Uh, my name is Andrew Borum. Um, I uh, have lived in Belgium for the last 35 years. Um, and I have worked for various news organizations, for a pharmaceutical industry lobby, for the European Commission and the European Parliament. Now we will begin our interview. And as with all our, our interviews, we begin with the same first question. So, Andrew, what does Brexit mean to you? For me, Brexit is uh, an unmitigated disaster. Um, I think uh, that for young people, it, it's uh, very sad that they don't have the opportunities I had 35 years ago to come to Europe, get a job, work, fall in love, buy a house, all these things. Um, and that's my main concern at, at the moment. For me personally, it's a disaster because it makes my, my status here very unclear. I have to um, try to apply to become a Belgian national because if I remain British, I suffer all the effects of Brexit directly. Um, and becoming a Belgian national is quite difficult for somebody as old as I am. For younger people who, who grew up here, okay. My daughter is uh, becoming a, a Belgian national and it seems to be going okay. For me, it's much more complicated. Great, thank you. You mentioned in your introduction that you have worked for the European Parliament. Um, how, how has Brexit affected the work that you have done there and been able to carry out at the Parliament? Well, in some ways, um, it has actually made it a lot easier. You'll remember the UKIP MEPs were not only did not contribute to the work of the Parliament, Nigel Farage turned up to one Fisheries Committee meeting, but were constantly making rude, silly remarks, holding up the business of parliament. They were basically there to sabotage it. So the work of parliament, I'm sure, has gone much more smoothly because it doesn't have this British grit fouling up the works. Thank you. Um, now, what about you personally um, and the work you have done there? Um, I know you have worked on, on roaming charges, for example, which for viewers, just to clarify, is for Brits, when we were traveling in the EU, we wouldn't have to pay charges when using mobile data um, or sending texts out there. Um, I would say that um, while Britain was in the parliament, a lot of members, non-UKIP members, did make constructive contributions to decisions. And I saw, British MEPs changing European legislation. This doesn't happen in the British Parliament. The British Parliament, basically, you get to accept or reject, but MEPs really do change the legislation that is going to apply to their country. I'm very sad that Britain has lost this ability to uh, have its say in rules, which are going to affect it anyway. As a th even as a third country, Britain will be affected by rules. Now, uh, roaming charges is my personal hobby horse. This I worked on for several years while I was at the European Commission. And people perhaps don't realize what a bloody battle it was for the Commission to get rid of roaming charges in the first place. Industry obviously didn't like these moves. We had to begin by insisting that they make their prices clear on websites. They didn't want to do this. Then we um, imposed a ceiling, so uh, a ceiling on prices beneath which they had to compete. Uh, they didn't like this either, but eventually it happened. It happened in stages um, with a lot of negotiation. Most EU 
uh, laws are actually formed in this way. They're formed through negotiation with industry and it's a long bloody battle. But everything I saw showed me that basically the commission and the parliament are on the side of the consumer. They're on the side of the little person. And Britain is now rapidly removing all the safeguards that the EU put in place for industry, including British industry. Thank you. That's that's very interesting um, to hear. Uh, now, again, earlier you talked about how Brexit has affected you personally. Uh, for example, it's it's you said you're now having to apply for Belgium citizenship. Um, could you could you please expand on other ways that Brexit has personally affected you? Um, under the EU UK withdrawal agreement, um, in principle, you're allowed to remain where you are, provided that you um, can prove that, that what you're doing is legitimate and that you're not going to cost the Belgian state anything. Basically, whenever Britain uh, introduces another rule or policy which discriminates against uh, EU citizens in Britain, the other countries have to respond. Um, this means that um, Brits who, who live in Belgium, who weren't allowed to vote in the Brexit referendum because we've been here for more than 15 years, have to suffer the consequences anyway. We have no say in what is happening to us. Uh, for younger people, it's much worse because they have lost the right to free movement. They can't travel to other EU countries and get a job, buy a house without a lot of complications. They probably will have to get citizenship of those countries to do it. Um, again, for me personally, uh, thank God I have a pension from the EU. So this means that I can afford to pay for healthcare. Otherwise my healthcare bill would have gone from 300 euro up to 3000 overnight. Um, uh, I mean, those are just examples, but the, the it, it actually complicates everything you do. Belgium has a very good EID system which allows you to um, pay bills, prove who you are for whatever purpose. Um, and there's a risk that we could lose this ID as well if we don't become Belgian, uh, which then thrusts us back into a lot of bureaucratic paperwork, which is basically pre-EU. It's what Britain is now going to have to uh, reintroduce because it has left the EU. It's going to make your whole lives like they would have been 50 years ago. Basically, this is this for me, this is a key impact for, for Brexit because I hate bureaucracy. And by the way, the EU has worked ever since I've been working for it and, and long before has been getting rid of bureaucracy, getting rid of tariffs. Uh, so Britain is trying to reintroduce the sort of bureaucracy that existed before there was even an Internet. Yes, I mean, from what you said, I can completely understand why it would <laughs> drive you mad. Um, and again, you know, as a young British citizen who wants to travel and wants to work abroad, I, I can I can empathise with you. You know, it's um, it's it's going to affect a lot of people, including myself. Well, we are now coming to our last question, Andrew, and you have been a very interesting guest. So thank you very much. Um, our last question will be. What is your message to everyone watching this interview regarding Brexit? My message is, my dear, I'm very sorry about this, but I think you have to be patient. I think Britain will rejoin the EU, but it will do it in slow stages. The first stages are rejoining the single market and rejoining the customs union, because this will remove all the trade barriers which are completely unnecessary, pointless, except to placate uh, leave voters. Um, but they would really facilitate business, they would facilitate trade. Great, thank you, Andrew. Um, you have been a wonderful, wonderful guest and um, it has been great to interview you. Um, thank you very much. Thank you.